I want to put into perspective just how bad a problem we inherited in, in London, because at the end of the Second World War, I completely, I understandably, I, the government of the day, across all parties, made a historic mistake about its strategy for the development of the city in the post-war period. I, at the start of the Second World War, London's population was eight and a half, eight and three quarter million people. At the end of the war, the decision was taken that between uh, then, 1945 and 1990, the population of the city would be managed down to between five or five and a half million. And this, one can understand all the great reformers who had seen the steaming squalor of our slums, I, all the uh, great struggles of Victorian England to build good housing, uh, to create an education system, a sewer system. The density of population was seen as a problem. And therefore, both Labour and Conservative governments went through decades of specifically building new towns around London and encouraging people and industries to leave. So that by the time you got to the 1980s, uh, London's population had come down to about six and three quarter million. But by that stage, we'd stopped the process of dispersal. And I think that the, the key in all of this was that uh, perhaps this might have worked, except that by the time you got to the, the late 1960s and the 1970s, we were seeing the collapse of manufacturing. Uh, something like a million and a half jobs disappeared over a generation in manufacturing. A city where unemployment had really been non-existent became a city where there were huge areas where high levels of unemployment and social deprivation. And of course, those invariably became the areas where um, refugees and immigrants tended initially um, to settle. And by the mid-1970s, just as I first became elected to city government at uh, the old Greater London Council, we recognised this was creating problems and we stopped the active encouragement of firms and people uh, leaving the city. And the docks, of course, had also collapsed and uh, moved out. So a huge ongoing uh, problem of unemployment. And still today, unemployment is always that one or two percent more in London than it is in the rest uh, of England. But just at the point where city planners realised this strategy had been a mistake, we saw the election of Mrs. Satcher's government and basically a, 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 a massive reduction in terms of public sector investment. In the 30 years after the Second World War, the state invested 5.5% of GDP year on year. That was the average. Mrs. Satcher reduced that to 1%. So just at the time when we might have been thinking to attract new industries, to try and uh, reconfigure our city, uh, the flow of public funding was cut off. And even with the election of Tony Blair, at the end of that 13 years of Blair and Brown, still the state was only investing 2% of GDP. So huge backlogs of projects that had been on hold, projects that had been debated since I was born. We've only just um, actually completed. Um, and this I mean, was a very unsatisfactory background. So I mean, to make it worse, Mrs. Satcher, um, then abolished the Greater London Council because it really didn't want a lot of people complaining, um, uh, and uh, as we generally tended to. We then went through 14 years without any central city administration at all. No one collating data, no one devising a strategy, and it was seen as this was a big step forward in reducing the size of the state. Business would flourish and fill the gap left by the state and so on. And a... The only thing that uh, Mr. Satcher did that had a huge impact and did create employment during that period was to completely deregulate the financial sector. So in the mid-1970s, finance and business services was about 18% of employment in London. By the time I was elected as mayor, we were looking at over a third, coming up to something like 38%. So as manufacturing was wiped out, the jobs that were created were in finance and business services. And of course, virtually nobody from manufacturing or the docks uh, had the skills or no one set up the programs to give people the skills to move into the sector 
that then actually come. Also, and most probably linked to that deregulation of the financial centre, London's population started to grow without anyone being particularly aware of it at the time. So at a point where there was basically no investment in new housing, in transport infrastructure, we were seeing a growing population putting services under more and more strain, people turning up at hospital had intolerable waits, the waiting list for housing just grew immensely long, the transport system started to break down more and more regularly because there wasn't that investment in upgrading the rail system. And as the public transport got worse, more people got in their cars. So by the time I was elected mayor in 2000, the average speed of cars in central London was nine miles per hour, whereas a generation earlier, it had been 12 miles per hour. And I mean, in the run-up to that election, big business was saying to me, you have got to deal with this or big firms will start to leave. They find they, you know, somebody who wanted to go, a financier who wanted to go from a meeting in the city of London to one in the West End, didn't know how long that journey was going to take. Might be lucky, 20 minutes, unlucky, could be 50 minutes. And this situation was visibly getting worse. And so big business was demanding um, in two senses, a complete change. They wanted a, a system of congestion charging and taxation on travel. They also wanted the mayor to lead the campaign to get a major um, program of public investment um, in transport and in the city generally. Uh, after 30 years earlier, when there was a general complaint about uh, from this big business that public investment was driving out private sector investment, uh, they'd seen the collapse of public sector investment down from that 5.5% to 1% of GDP. It hadn't worked. They were now looking to the newly elected mayor's office um, to drive um, that whole U-turn on that approach to public sector investment. And so we started, when I became mayor, just having had no one doing anything for 14 years, the first task was to find out what was going on, to analyse the data, the census, and the business um, patterns of uh, growth and decline, but also to put that into a global context. I, I don't think there's any possibility of a reversal of the process of globalisation. I think actually the process of globalisation huge, holds huge opportunities for humanity if we get it right and we manage it without too many casualties along the way. And so we looked at what was likely to be the potential for London in an increasingly open and deregulated global economy. And in particular, the impact of the growing um, nations like China and India, Brazil, um, in terms of their impact on uh, our potential, what we could do. We looked at, uh, given that to have 38% of your employment in one sector, finance and business services, is extremely risky, as we discovered uh, when the banking crisis came. So we looked what other sectors of the economy we could uh, increase and drive forward. And clearly, you can't claw back the manufacturing or the docks employment that we had lost. I mean, already in China today, low-skill manufacturing is being exported to the rest of Southeast Asia, and they are concentrating on more and more upskilling and high-tech manufacturing. And so we looked at the other things that we have that make a great world city. Well, the truth is, none of you have ever come for a holiday in London to see our bankers. You've come to see the cultural offer that we have, or the shopping. Uh, or the parks, the theatres, all of that. And this is a vital part. And you actually look at those cities that endure century after century. Uh, they all have a great cultural base uh, in Paris and New York. It's the, the dynamism of that, um, lying side by side with whatever uh, the major economic driving force is, gives it a, a, a security, I think, that other industries can rise and fall that cultural offer thing that means people always want to come to those cities uh, is important to, to um, uh, develop. And clearly, uh, in London, higher education. I mean, we have several universities that are ranked with, I mean, like Imperial, the LSE, ranked with Harvard or Oxford. And in a sense, it's a misnomer to call them universities. They are basically great centres of research which allow students to come along and learn something 
uh, whereas the vast bulk of our higher education is actually about the training of students for these great centres of excellence. They are the generators of ideas, new products and processes, and therefore building those was crucial um, because of the impact of that research and the spin-off you can get. To continue to drive that cultural agenda, um, and obviously the things that come from that as well in terms of the uh, big increase in tourism. I mean, by the end of this decade, there'll be 200 million Chinese rich enough to come for holiday in Europe. We want them all to come to London, not all at once. That would be a problem. And I suspect, I mean, if you've grown up under the pressures that there are in Shanghai, a nice trip up the fjords of Norway would be very attractive as well. So it's something that you should be looking at. And also, I mean, increasingly, the, the health industry, which is what we should honestly call it, I mean, in terms of research, in development of genetic engineering, biotechnologies, this will increasingly come to feature now that we are so close to being able to do more and more in terms of the manipulation of the human genome. I mean, everyone in my family dies of a heart attack. Somewhere in there, there's a gene that makes us vulnerable to it. Everyone in my family would be quite happy to pay several thousand pounds to have it removed from their body. And those sort of areas of development, all high skill, all high tech. There is no route for a, uh, an advanced uh, economy or an advanced city to go back down um, the, the ladder in terms of the, the jobs that are on offer. It must always be a question of driving it up. So that we devised a plan that was built around that. The other key factor coming into this plan was the question of climate change and the quality of the environment. London was undoubtedly the, the least attractive large city in Europe in environmental terms. A, the air quality still kills 4,000 people a year prematurely. A, our parks and green spaces had all been under pressure. The squalor from I mean, just the concentration of traffic on our roads. It was a, a city where you felt the environmental um, offer was getting worse. And of course, temperature um, was going up. We now have less rainfall than Madrid as a city. And the biggest increase in temperature over the last 30 years in Britain has been in London because you get this heat island effect. The concentration of tarmac and concrete and brick acts like a great uh, uh, heater, a storage heater. And so at the middle, I mean, about two or three o'clock in the morning, in the height of summer, the difference in temperature between being in central London and outside, just outside central London, can be as much as six degrees Celsius. And that inability to cool down overnight, to have a good night's sleep, all of these are big problems. And we saw it most clearly in terms of the Thames Barrier. I was, I'd been leader of the GLC for about a year when we opened the Thames Barrier. And each year we used to raise it twice on average. I, now we raise it twice a month. In a bad month, we raise it three times. And that perhaps is the most dramatic example of the impact of global warming. And I was arguing with the government about how soon we needed to build a bigger barrier a bit farther out to sea. And the government saying, well, most of it would be all right to for about 100 years, and my argument very strong, you really can't take a risk like that. You actually need to have it there by the middle of the century. And so we also had a duty in looking at this to think, what can we do in how we develop and redesign the city and modernize the city that reduces its contribution to global warming, that reduces its carbon emissions? And a, this runs completely contrary to that original post-war plan of reducing the density of the city. I mean, if you look at What's happening in China today with this now? Huge, now 45% of the Chinese living in cities and huge growth of cities. And I can't remember what the exact numbers is, but something like over the next 20 years, 100 new cities of a million people each. That's a mistake. It would be better to have 10 cities of 10 million people each because you get the concentration of humanity that allows the public transport system um, to be incredibly effective that actually allows you to create the um, recycling industries locally. It means a, a city of that size can deal with all its waste. Uh, in a whole range of ways, the densification of a city can be environmentally more sustainable than just slowly spacing out more and more suburbs. 